Okay, uh, hopefully this will work out a little better for you guys. I'm going to try to give you an overview on chapter 14, which is about waves, beaches, and coasts, or as uh, we can refer to them as the shorelines. I'm going to take this a little bit out of order from what your book has, but uh, you'll hopefully see why in just a moment. So this is what we're going to be dealing with here, this portion of area here. Now, the shoreline or the coastal area is a very dynamic area. This is an area where you have the interaction of land, sea, and air. Um, it tends to be a very high energy environment. You have waves coming in. Those waves are going to modify the shoreline. Uh, you also have intense human activity today, which can also cause some major changes. So let's look at what the shoreline is and get a good definition of it, a good understanding of it so that we are all on the same page. Now, the shoreline is basically going to be the area that is going to denote the contact between land and sea. However, it extends greatly inland um, de depending on what we're talking about based on high tide, low tide, storm effects as well. So we're going to look at this in, in, here in just a moment, kind of look at the different areas of it. So first and foremost, we're going to look at the shore area. And I've drawn this out for you, and hopefully this will be easier to see in this way. Um, first and foremost, we have this point right here, which we're going to refer to as basically sea level. Um, this is the actual interface between the water and the land, the water being the blue line, the land being the black. And there are a couple of different things. We're going to talk about these again in a little bit, but we have the high tide mark, which is the point at which the water is at its highest during the course of the day or the month, and the low tide mark. This is where the water is at its lowest point because sea level rises and lowers during the course of the day due to the tides. So we call that area of the high tide, low tide mark the foreshore area. Now, behind that is what we call the backshore. This is the landward of the high tide mark. We can see a few features in it sometimes. In areas that are undisturbed, there will sometimes be little berms on it. Those berms are actually what we uh, are storm-driven berms. So these are where the last big storm drove materials up onto the beach area and left a pile. The back end of it is usually something we call a storm bench. This is the area where these are the largest storms that have affected the area over the course of several thousand years. And they create this distinct line, this distinct bench. Behind that, you'll sometimes, depending on the nature of the area, you'll see dunes or you'll see a change in the uh, morphology of the land as well. So the storm bench is really that boundary that we're going to consider between the shore and the coast. So this is, the, this is what we would actually refer to as the coastline today, geologically speaking. Now, if we look further out, further out into the area, we have the near shore which is the area outwards from the low tide mark. This is basically the point where the waves, as they're coming in, begin to feel the bottom. Waves break, or they change their shape as they come into the shoreline, and that happens once the bottom of the wave begins to feel physically the bottom of the ocean. Now I'll draw that out for you guys in just a minute. But basically, Anything that is outside of that point where the waves begin to break is offshore. So this whole area here would is something we could consider the shoreline area. Now, one of the things that we do tend to see in, that makes up most of the shore and the back shore is a beach. A beach is an accumulation of sediment, usually sand, um, that is along the landward margins of an ocean or a lake. Um, generally speaking, it's a relatively flat platform. It is marked with a change of slope at the seaward edge, as well as has a wet face, which is usually where the water is lapping up onto it. In this case, that would be the zone between the high tide and low tide. 
So let's move over and talk about waves. So keep this in mind because this is a lot of what's happening here is going to play a role in what we're seeing happen. So waves are basically a way that energy is transmitted through water. Okay, so before we start, let's look at the characteristics of the waves and then we'll explain how they actually form. All right, so the top of the wave is usually referred to, let me get over here so you guys can see, is usually referred to as the crest. The bottom is the trough. I know my spelling is gonna look atrocious with these little pens. If I take a measurement from crest to crest, or from trough to trough, that's gonna be a measurement we call the wave length. And that will vary depending on the amount of energy in the system, okay? <clears throat> now, if we measure the distance between the crest to the trough, that will tell us the wave height, okay? So then we can take this and look at it in series of time if we take the wavelength and divide that by the amount of time that, or shows how much time takes to pass, that would be the wave period. If we divide the time, uh, the number of waves into a given unit of time, that becomes the wave frequency, okay? So we can tell a lot of things about the waves and their energy relationships based on that. We're not gonna get too much into it here, but we can. So how does the wave actually get started? What creates the waves in the open ocean? It's wind. Simple answer is wind. Waves are created by wind blowing over the water. You can see this around here if you go out to Patagonia Lake or Peña Blanca Lake or any sort of pond that develops during the monsoon season. When the wind blows over it, you can see little waves start to form on it. Now, um, Basically, when we look at what's going to create the waves, what's going to affect the waves, the height, the length, the period of the waves are going to be dependent on three different things. How fast is the wind blowing? The wind speed. The greater the wind speed, the more energy it can be imparting into the surface of the water. What is the length of time the wind has blown? The longer the wind is able to blow over the water, the bigger the waves can be. And then what is the fetch, or the distance the wind blew over the water? The longer the wind can blow in the same direction, the bigger the waves are gonna be. Now, basically, um, waves in the ocean are actually the combination of two different types of waves. One is the wave of oscillation. The other is the, is the wave of translation. Um, when a wave goes by like this, what you see happening is, is if you're sitting here in an inner tube, your motion will be just simply up and down, okay? So the energy of the wave is moving, but the water isn't. This is a wave of oscillation. So in the open ocean, when waves go by, large waves go by, you go up and down, you don't get carried with the wave. However, when a wave starts to get to shallow water, it changes into a wave of translation. Let me see if I can draw this for you. So, if we draw this as a shore environment, and we bring in
what happens is the wave is going to be a oscillating motion. So what technically is happening is you have a combination of things that are happening. You have the wave that's trying, the circular motion that's trying to go as well as it's translating. Um, so the net effect is that the energy of the motion is, is trying to do the circular while moving at the same time and it creates the sinusoidal wave that we see. This pattern though of energy movement only extends down a certain distance below the surface of the water um, based on the wave. It's basically about the wavelength down. So the wave is self-contained. So if that's the wavelength, it goes down about the same amount. Once the wave begins to encounter the bottom, there begins to be drag. It slows down. So what happens is as the wave begins to feel the bottom, it begins to slow down. The back end of the wave, though, doesn't know what the front end of the wave knows. So what happens is this begins to pile up. So if we were looking at this in a sequence, what we would see is something like this, where the wave is coming in, it begins to feel the bottom, begins to pile up, piles up more. And what's actually happening is that the back end of the wave is moving slightly faster than the front end of the wave. So it's climbing up and over, which creates this crescent type of shape until the wave gets so big it collapses down on itself. <clears throat> now, over time, this energy is going to just pound on the surface of the land. So we see this wave front collapse. It becomes what we call a breaking wave. Uh, it begins to break where it begins to rise. That's where we're going to call our nearshore environment. Um, and then the turbulent water after the break just rushes up above. This creates a lot of energy and a lot of force on materials and it literally will pound materials into fragments and fragments into smaller parts. So you have a lot of impact in energy. If you've ever sat in a wave pool or at a beach where there's been significant sized waves coming in and you just try to stand there and let that wave hit you, it can knock you down or or worse with it. So that's something we have to keep in mind. But this energy and uh, pressure that's bringing is also going to move a lot of material. Now it's not uncommon for material to move perpendicular to the shoreline. And the reason for this is that it's not common for waves to actually come in perpendicular to the shoreline. So if I have a shoreline, let's say is a fairly flat shoreline like this, and my, I've got waves that, wave fronts, that come in at a slight angle, like this. What's going to happen is a couple of things. One, as the wave begins to hit the uh, near shore environment, it's going to bend a little bit. It's going to try to bend and become parallel to the surface of the, um, the shoreline. But what happens more importantly is the energy of the wave doesn't move that much. And so what happens is when this wave front comes in, it's gonna push material in this direction. But when the water then rushes back out, it's gonna go perpendicular to slope. So it's gonna go like that. And if you do this enough times, you basically create a situation where the effect is this particle is moved from here to there in what we call a long shore current. So it's traveling much greater distance, but the effect is to move the material in this way. And we can actually see that in uh, a number of man-made structures. Um, let's see if I can find a good example of it. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, page 384 in your book. So this would be 
an example of what happens with a long shore drift or a long shore current where the sand is coming in this way and it builds up on the structure and creates a sawtooth like structure. Um, so we get these long shore currents. We also create shore, uh, shore currents, uh, the surf zone, um, all sorts of different features. You can get rip currents. Rip currents are very deadly currents where the water is actually flowing as a current under the water. And so if you get caught in one, you can get swept out uh, to, to sea for some distance. Um, very dangerous things. You have to you know, keep your wits about you if you ever get swept up into one figure out which way is up because that's one of the problems that happens to people when they get swept into it is they don't know which way is up and they can swim in the wrong direction. Staying calm helps, sort of like uh, when you take a test. Okay, So let's talk about some of the um, other things that can happen besides that. We kind of talked about the wave refraction that can happen, which is the bending of the wave as it's coming in. Um, but also if you have something sticking out, So we have a jut of land sticking out like this. Um, that wave is going to bend itself and try to concentrate its energy on the point that is sticking out. So this will actually take a lot of the energy and focus it into one specific area. This can actually create some interesting features as we'll see in just a little bit, but it's something that we have to keep in mind when we build in these environments that when we build outwards like that, we can be attracting the wave energy and therefore, you know, we need to consider how strong we have to build those features. Uh, let's see. We can have currents that are, are moving along the shore feature. Um, let's see, we've already talked about that to a degree. Um, types of shorelines uh, or wave intensity. Wave intensity can play a big role that's really not dependent on anything about the shoreline itself with the exception of the direction the shoreline is facing um, that can play a role in how much wave intensity there is but generally speaking if you're in an open ocean environment or an, op uh, an open coastline environment it's the number and power of storms out over the open ocean that are going to control what sort of wave intensity you see over time now, in terms of the types of shoreline or coastline that we have, there are basically three types that we can have. Stable, sinking, rising. So what are we talking about? We're really talking about what the land is doing at the shoreline. If it's stable, the land is neither rising up or laying down. It usually creates a nice, big, broad beach environment. If the ground is sinking, that means the beach is going to be moving further and further inland. Um, generally speaking, it's, that becomes a bit of a depositional environment uh, in the ocean, and it's an erosional environment at the beach. And it just keeps moving in. Then we have rising, so tectonically rising. Um, this would be akin to the western coast of the United States, especially in California. Whereas the sinking would be more like the east coast of the United States or even parts of the Gulf Coast. So let's talk about some of the things that we can see based on wave erosion. This is where we get back into the features that can be caused by this type of concentration of the wave energy. So one feature, especially at a rising coastline that we can see is what we call a wave cut platform. And basically what a wave cut platform is, is pretty much what it sounds like. Is you have a cliff, you have a platform underwater, and you have the ocean on top. And basically what had happened is that at one point, this cliff may have been back here, but as the wave energy comes in and smashes against the cliff, it undermines the cliff. And sooner or later, that undermining gets to the point where that part there jump, drops off through mass wasting, and then it, the process starts over again, and we just 
continually bring this platform back until you get to the point where the platform is so long that it dissipates the energy of the waves and the waves no longer can do uh, hit. Now in a rising coastline situation, if especially in Southern California, get a large earthquake and now the coastline jumps up, a significant difference, all of a sudden instead of this being sea level, this could be sea level and the process starts down here on this lower cliff. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but that creates a wave cut cliff and a wave cut platform. Now other features we can get are sea stacks and sea arches. Um, the sea arch is if we get the situation um, where we have this feature that juts out like this, but instead of being a flat coastline, it's more of a, um, a, a point. Let me draw both a map view and a plan view, or a, a side view. So in map view, what we were looking at just before would be just like this. So this would be the coast, here's our cliff, platform, and then deeper ocean here. But for what we're talking about here, we're talking about having a feature that maybe does this. So for whatever reason, we have a ton of land that is jutting out into the ocean. So we're gonna look at it from this view here. So if we look at it from there, what we'll see is something that looks like this. where we have our wave cut cliff coming in. This is our cliff here. Maybe this is a small beach. The platform is out here, but we have this jutting material out. What will happen is, is as the wave energy gets focused on this, because of that refraction environment, it will tend to get focused actually towards the center of this. And so over time, what we may see is a hole develop in this like that. And that creates what we call a sea arch. So it's like an arched bridge structure that would be uh, under here. So we'd have this opening that would be in this area here. Now, if the arch develops big enough, it will ultimately get to a point where it gets so big that the center portion can't hold out too much longer and eventually you get something happens and it breaks away like that and you're left with a feature like this which is now a C stack. So a C stack indicates where you had a C arch that has collapsed. So you can figure out some of the history of the area, even though the arch is gone. You can still make out that there was an arch there at one point. Um, now that's basically the main erosional features that we see associated with beaches. However, there are features that are associated with the movement of sediment along the beaches. Uh, I'm just gonna go over them and kind of describe them to you. Uh, there are spits, and sometimes referred to also as hooks, um, spits are basically ridges of sand that extend from the land into the mouth of a bay. Um, it's a sandbar, basically, is another way to do it. But its specific name is based on the way it curves. The end of them sometimes curve out. If it's straight, we usually just refer to it as actually a sandbar. If it curves out, it's a spit. If it curves in, it's a hook. So you spit out of your mouth, a hook goes into the mouth type of deal. Uh, but there are basically sand ridges, sandbars that are moving around, mainly because of long shore currents. If it blocks the bay completely, it becomes what we call a bay mouth bar. So a bar, it's connecting across and blocking off a, a bay, turning it into a lagoon. Um, sometimes what we'll see in a situation, sometimes similar to the sea stack, is we can have a little island that is out offshore, just a small island. And it turns out that there will be a bar of sand that will connect it. But that bar of sand is only open at low tide. 
So you can cross it during low tide, high tide it disappears. We call that a Tom Bolo. Um, that's a very specific name for it, but it's just, it's a sandbar that's only visible at lower tide levels and it disappears at higher tide levels. We can also have barrier islands. Uh, these are more common along the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast of North America. Um, they are low ridges of sand that are parallel to the shore, usually anywhere between 3 and 30 kilometers offshore, so a mile and a half to 10 miles, more or less. Um, low, and I do mean low, they're only a few feet above sea level. They seem to be uh, built and destroyed by hurricanes, primarily. Um, so really depends on what the situation is. There are some other features we can get into related to uh, glacial environments and whatnot, but for our purposes here, this is really all that you really need to remember. So keep in mind, you know, a sea stack, a sea arch, spits and hooks, bay mouth bar, and barrier islands. Those are primarily the features of um, the beach area or the shoreline that you really need to pay attention to. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we try to do constantly is stabilize the beach. Because why? Well, if you remember the original diagram I drew, um, a lot of our communities today, starting about in the 1950s that are, are in the coastal environment, are actually are in the shore. They're not on the coastline, they're in the shoreline. Um, this is because what happened is, is people wanted to be closer to the beach, they wanted better access, they built closer to the beach, and cities just kept moving, features kept getting closer and closer to the water. So you have whole communities that are built seaward of the coastline. Um, dumb mistake, but it's one we have to live with now. So what happens is that in as these areas get developed, you seal off the way for materials to come in and replenish the beaches. Keep in mind that as the waves come in, they're dragging material back out. Uh, nature does not like anything above sea level. If nature had its way, everything would be probably about 30 meters below sea level at its highest point. So nature is constantly pulling at the material on the shoreline, but because of the way we've built up the shoreline environments, we are no longer letting that sediment come back in. So now we try to do these things to stabilize the shore, to replenish the shore. Um, basically, you can look at things like uh, in the Mississippi uh, Delta area. The Mississippi River. We try to keep the Mississippi River open for rivering transport, so we send the Army Corps of Engineers in there to dig the sediment out of the river to keep the channels open for the large ships. What that does, though, is that causes the amount of sediment reaching the um, delta to, deep, to decrease greatly, and the delta is disappearing. It's sinking underwater. Same thing on the shorelines. If, uh, if you're not near a sediment-laden river, you're not getting that sediment, you have to get the sediment coming in off of the areas above the coast. And the way that gets developed, when you have a lot of development happens, that reduces the amount of erosion, which reduces sediment transport, which means the water coming in is actually sediment-starved, and it can actually help carry more sediment away from the shore environment as it goes into the ocean. Um, so we get this that combined with topography, combined with weather patterns and wave patterns, uh, the configuration of the shoreline, there are certain areas that have just terrible times with beach erosion. And so there are things that are done to try to fix that. I'm just gonna go through some of them. Uh, there are jetties, which are usually built in pairs, and those are usually developed to try to maintain harbors. That was this um, picture I showed you here. That's jetties right there. It's two jetties that are built to try to protect the entryway into a harbor air, or an area. I'm sorry, jetty right here. Protect an area into a river or a harbor is jetties. So if you do them just along the ground and you're not protecting a, a waterway, they become groins, basically the same type of idea. Um, you can have a breakwater, which is like a wall that you build offshore to try to dissipate the energy of the waves before they get into the nearer environment. 
Um, you can have seawalls, which are similar to breakwaters, but they are further in, closer to the shoreline itself. Sometimes on the shoreline or uh, just off the beach itself, the, the idea is to try to stop the waves again, like a breakwater does. Um, generally speaking, these features are not very efficient. They require a lot of maintenance, they require a lot of care, and you're still going to lose sediment. And that's where beach nourishment comes into play. And this is the idea where they go in and they scoop large quantities of sand from the sea floor and put it back onto the beach, which means it's just going to go right back to the, where it was. You created a hole in the offshore environment, wants to fill it in, it's going to take it from the shore environment and just cycle, cycle, cycle. Waste of time, effort, and money. Uh, realistically speaking, if we wanted to fix this situation, we could just get everybody off the shore and basically figure out where the storm benches were and say, you know what, no more construction, no construction at all from the from this hard physical geological point seaward. No, you can't build there. We're not going to let you do that. Expensive because you have to relocate a lot of people, maybe even whole cities in some cases, but you know, we also have, if you look at Hurricane Sandy that hit uh, the New York, New Jersey area, some of the things that are interesting there is that um, a lot of the, what is land today was not land 200 years ago. It was ocean. And we have filled in some of these environments to make new land. They would call it landfills, not the type that you put your trash in, but kind of similar. That's the areas that got hit the hardest in the hurricane. Well, gee, you know, maybe if we don't do stuff like that and put ourselves into harm's way, you know, get a whole argument there. But that gets into the idea of relocating places. Um, generally speaking, if we look at plate tectonics from a plate tectonic standpoint, the differences between the east coast of North America and the west coast of North America, as well as the east coast of South America and the west coast of South America, are very easily understood and explainable. The eastern coast of the Americas are on a passive tectonic margin. In other words, there's no active plate boundary right there, and they actually face a spreading ridge, which I know we, we, we're going to be talking about again here real soon. So these are areas where you tend to have a very flat um, slope out from the coast into the ocean environment. Basically, it's a broad sloping coastal plain. <coughs> They're tectonically quiet. My throat decides to itch. Um, they tend to receive the full force of storms. So when that storm energy comes in, it can move in tens of miles in, some, in worst cases. The Pacific coast, on the other hand, it tends to be a relatively narrow beach that are backed by steep cliffs, usually. Um, you have areas that have significant narrowing of the beaches because of erosion that's happening. Uh, the shoreline erosion varies considerably from one area to another because of the complex nature of the um, of the area as well as the, how sporadic storms tend to be. Uh, one of the things that we see is that storms off of oceans tend to be much more common on the east coast as you go up up in latitude and, and less common as you go closer to the equator. So you can have a lot of variability in the storms that come in over the year. <clears throat> um, we've already talked about uh, the types of coastlines in terms of whether they're stable, emerging, or uplifting, or sinking. Um, basically, we can also classify that as a submergent coast, is a sinking coastline, tend to be caused by subsidence of some sort. Uh, the eastern coast of the United States it tends to be this, in part because of what we call isostatic adjustment, which we haven't really covered yet. We will be covering it soon, but basically the land is slowly sinking downwards. As more sediment gets piled on top of it, it slowly sinks. Um, whereas the west coast of North America is an emergent system. You have a lot of uplifting area mainly caused by tectonic activity that's pushing areas up sporadic and then they occasionally drop down when that energy is released. Um, we tend to see a lot of wave cut, cut, 
cliffs and platforms, very narrow beaches, that sort of thing. And the sea level, um, then we get the sea level rising situation where that makes some of these hard to tell. You have to look at what's tectonically happening and try to back that out if you're making your sea level calculations. The last thing I want to talk about um, today are tides. <laughs> Tides are basically a um, change in sea level that occurs on a daily basis. It's caused by the gravitational force of the Earth and the Moon. Um, there are two types of tides. There's the spring tide and the neap tide. Uh, it's basically going to be the orientation of the Earth-Moon system to tell us which one is going to be which. So to draw it out roughly, if this is the sun over here, a neap tide occurs, I'm sorry, a spring tide occurs when the earth, moon, and sun all form in a line. So that's typically gonna happen with a new moon or a full moon. A neap tide situation is going to be where we have the Earth, Moon, and Sun forming a right angle to each other. So that's going to be typically the um, quarter moons, the first quarter or third quarter of the moon being full. Basically a spring tide is going to be a higher high tide and a lower low tide whereas the neap tide is going to be a lower high tide and a higher low tide. So basically the idea is that in the spring tide we have a greater variability between the high and low tide. In the neap tide we have a lower variability between the two. Um, there are some other factors that can play a role in how the tides are affected. Um, the shape and, and of the coastline, the orientation of the coastline can actually cause it. You can see areas that have you know, minimal, only a few feet of change on a daily basis, and there are areas that have over 30 feet of change on a daily basis. So a lot of that has to do with the shape of the environment that they're in, the way they look and the way they flow. Generally speaking, though, when the tides come in or go out, they create currents. You have a flood current, which is the current when the tide is coming in. You have an ebb current when the tide is going out. In some areas, uh, the, um, oh shoot, it's a river in Thailand. I can't remember the name of it. Um, they get a, a flood current that creates what they call a tidal bore. Think of it as a wave of water moving up a river and it can be three or four feet high and it literally will travel 20 miles upstream. In fact, there are actually some people who make their living in Thailand using the river um, in that they float down the river with uh, materials in, in one part of the day and then they actually will, for all intents and purposes, surf the tidal bore back up the river later on in the day. So they, they use the river for their mode of transport. It's actually pretty cool. They actually videos of people surfing the tidal bore. You can find that on YouTube. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, these currents can actually alternate. They alternate at least twice a day. They're not always the same time because it's a matter of the changing angles between the Earth, Sun, Moon, as well as the, the system rotating around, plus the Earth spinning on its axis. So. You have to look at the tidal charts to figure out exactly when the, those are going to happen. But basically, a good way to think of it is that if we blew this up, it's a bulge of water, and the Earth basically rotates around and through the bulge. The bulge of water pretty much stays put. This is one of the reasons why we also tend to see uh, tidal effects seem to be stronger on the east coast than they are on the west coast of a continent, in part because that bulge is, you're rotating into the bulge with the east coast and you're, ro you're rotating away from the bulge with the west coast. Now, tides actually have a great influence on the earth itself. In 
part, this is because these systems are not perfectly aligned. Um, when we look at the moon in this system, in part because of the rotational rate of the Earth, the tidal bulge is always just a little bit ahead of the moon in terms of the rotation of the moon. This ends up putting a force on the moon and a force on the Earth itself. So it creates a drag force on the Earth and a rotational, a, a, an accelerative force on the moon. So every 100 years, a day gets longer by two thousandths of a second. Now that does not seem like a lot. Two thousandths of a second, that means over the course of a thousand years, a day gets two seconds longer. Two seconds. What's that? One one thousand, two one thousand. There you go. Two seconds. But over the course of millions and even billions of years, this slowly makes the day shorter. But it also makes the moon faster. And the faster the moon moves, the further away from the Earth it has to be. When the moon formed, um, initially, if you were able to stand on the planet and watch moonrise, the moon would have taken up a quarter of the sky, the full moon, one quarter of the sky. Today, it's you know you can hold a quarter out at arm's length, and that's about the size of the moon. Okay, so the moon is actually receding away from the Earth, but also at that same time when the Earth formed. A day was probably on the order of about eight hours long, so we were spinning around a lot faster, uh, three times faster. So as the sun, as the Earth moves out, the the moon, I'm sorry, as the moon moves out from the Earth, the Earth has to slow down. This is to conserve what we call angular momentum. I'm not going to get into the effects of it too much, but it's basically the same reason if you've ever seen an ice skater when they're spinning around, if they have their arms in really tight, they spin fast, but when they stick their arms out, they slow down. It's the same principle. So as the moon moves out away from the Earth, the Earth-Moon system slows down, and, and that just maintains the same angular momentum in the system. But that means that the day is getting slowly longer. In the long run, one of two things is going to happen. The moon either gets so far out that it leaves the Earth system. Uh, actually, three things. The moon could become locked and uh, once the if the earth uh, rotation becomes the same as the moon's orbit they become face locked the moon quits moving out quit doesn't move back in uh, and then there's a, another one where if the moon moves out far enough it could in, it could encounter uh, issues with the solar wind and start to slow down and when it slows down it's going to come back in and well once it starts coming back in it's going to kind of hit eventually but that's billions of years from now. So anyway, hopefully it's about another 43 minute video. So hopefully this will help you. Uh, we'll t I'll ask questions about this. See if you guys have any questions about this. Feel free to post the questions in the forum or in the virtual class or online uh, or email them to me uh, through the class email link. So with that, I'll bid you guys adieu and have a good one.